Hello everybody, I'm very pleased that you're joining us here today. Thanks of course first to all, um, to everybody that is participating in our session today called Achieving Change in Mobility Behaviour. In um, the opening session, I'm not sure whether you followed this or not, but it was wonderful to hear that um, the people agreed that behavioral change is mandatory to achieve climate change and that we really have to look for something like an integrative approach, something like a holistic view um, to understand what is needed to achieve such a behavioral change. And that is exactly what we want to do today in this session. We like to exactly discuss this very interesting topic. So the session scope today is um, that you want to understand whether the European cities are on the right track. So it means, are we going to achieve behavioral change? Or maybe we did it already. Um, how do we achieve behavioral change at all? And um, whom or what is it exactly that we have to change in the end? Today we have a quite interesting and interdisciplinary panel with really lovely panelists from business and politics and also academia that um, will highlight and discuss different initiatives and that are contributing to make a shift towards sustainable, sustainable uh, mobility behaviors in reality. Our key points that we like to discuss are how can we change mobility behavior? What are potential pull factors for changing habits? What are key learnings from best practices? What is about the dark side of behavioral change? How did COVID-19 change our behaviors? How can we benefit from it? I'm not sure whether you followed the discussions the other days, but actually it was discussed whether we can say this is all very positive or whether we have to be now very careful to see how can we maybe see changes and um, judge about changes that maybe have been taking place during COVID. And change is a very long process with lots of setbacks and um, the question is always, how do we keep ourselves motivated? We do so since years already, but what is about the future? So our colleagues or our lovely panelists today are, and I like to start with Anna now. Perfect. <laughs> so Anna is an assistant professor at the Chair for Urban Mobility Futures at the University of Amsterdam. And her research focuses on transitions to sustainable and inclusive mobility. The role of smart technology for future of mobility and since more recently on the impact of COVID-19. And she will also talking through one of the projects in relation to that. Juan. Our second uh, panelist on the slide here is a former journalist and a communication expert working on mobility projects at Euro, Euro cities oh, since 2015 already. And he is uh, the secretary or he coordinates the European Mobility Week secretary and uh, the European wide campaign on sustainable urban mobility promoting behavioral change. So. He is originally from Spain, but he moved to Brussels already eight years ago. And there he started his executive master in European journalism. And uh, a funny story that he told us actually when we had our discussions beforehand already is that he started to learn cycling with the age of 25. But now he enjoys cycling, cycling as a child and he also enjoys, of course, his work communicating about other ways um, of moving. And we go exactly to the next slide. Um, 
to Frank. Um, Frank, that's his right pronouncing because I know this so well and also German. So Frank is from Germany, from Dresden, and he um, is from the politics field. So he graded, graduated in 2001 already as traffic engineer um, with the focus on urban mobility planning at the Technical University Dresden, in particularly at the Faculty of Transportation and Traffic Science. In 2013, so seven years already ago, he became the head of the Department for Traffic Development Planning in the City Administration of Dresden and is now responsible for all of the strategic questions of urban mobility, traffic mobility. He is part of some mobility analysis and intermodal, uh, intermodal mobility. So the integration of some, of course. So, and um, Dresden itself, the city in Germany in has or is part of several projects, just to mention a few of them. There is Smart City, a Horizon project 2020. There is some update, transfer, and of course, more. And finally, we have Juliana, and uh, she is also from Coventry University. Um, she joined uh, in January this year. Uh, but she was already beforehand active. She has 17 years background in international trade and stakeholder engagement. She currently manages delivery of two Interact projects. So she is active in Recreate and eSmart Tech. Uh, she worked already with the um, Birmingham Chamber of Commerce and the Department of International Trade. Uh, she has been advertised, um, advising local businesses on international strategies and delivered a variety of small and medium enterprise support programs, uh, inclusive of ERDF for international trade and support to medium sized businesses. Prior to that, she worked within industry mainly, um, covering positions as exec executive director with operational and board responsibilities in four different countries. She has developed and led an international team of 15 and took the company's expert turnover from zero to 40 million pounds by creating strategic partnerships in other 15 countries. So you see, we have a wonderful um, panel here with very different people with different backgrounds, which I think will become a very fruitful uh, discussion. But before we go into the statements, um, and before I try to uh, talk about the housekeeping rules so or the admin stuff, let me just briefly uh, tell a bit about myself. Um, I'm Anne Marie, I'm a professor at Coventry University, and I'm from business management. Um, I'm a professor in human resource management and organization and behavior um, with a key interest in mobility and urban planning. Um, while I'm originally a trust researcher, so everything that is about trust and distrust when it comes to acceptance of technologies or um, cultures, processes, structures, um, I'm very interested in this kind of behavioral change and what is needed to get a real behavioral change successfully implemented. So we're talking about organizational resilience, organizational capacity building. Um, before, yeah, let's start now with the housekeeping rules. And then I want I like to say something about a recent project because before panelists. Here are the housekeeping rules, quite important. Um, you can see exactly, hopefully, what you see at your desk at the minute. And you can see the different icons and you will find explanations to all of the different icons. So this is now very, very small. When you see um, the different icons there, we start to the left side. And there you see this little chat box. This is the internal chat and there you can engage with fellow participants. Below that, you see an icon where you can ask questions to the panelists here. So I will uh, see this as well to see whether I can repeat uh, your question, read them aloud. So please use this kind of um, icon. Uh, at the top, we have an icon that helps you to use the external chat to talk actually to everybody here. Uh, on the right top, you can leave the session and down right, you will see that um, 
please do not press this icon. Do not change because that's the layout set um, settings and um, the organization. So someone will take care of it in the background. So um, let me just um, briefly outline a few words um, about uh, the recent project, why um, maybe that was one of the reasons why I came to the uh, behavioral change, change idea. That is a project called SUITS, Sustainable Urban Mobility of, um, yeah, the implementation of sustainable, um, impl uh, sustainable urban mobility key performance um, factors. And the idea um, regarding suits is that we have to show, of course, as a city, evidence that we are actually able to um, be sustainable in our future mobility. And that means we have to think about how can we implement key performance indicators that make actually sense for a city and that we can demonstrate to the other stakeholders, to our citizens, to our wider society. And what um, I did at this project, which was actually funded by the Horizon 2020, uh, led by uh, Professor Andre Woodcock, a lovely colleague of mine at Coventry University, and I was responsible, responsible for the implementation of the package and Thus, I worked very, very closely with nine cities in Europe um, over the last four years to get this, let's say, behavioral change actually implemented successfully. Just a few words. We had a very interesting approach that we developed together. Um, our idea of a change process is divided into eight different steps, where we start from a building a team to actually keep the momentum, keep the people motivated to, in the end, make the change sticky. Um, what was quite successful was the interactive approach that we applied. So we worked very closely with the cities along six different workshops, which were held together or in, in the particular cities to um, talk individual, uh, very individual with the cities to understand their needs, their um, circumstances and all the challenges in the city. Um, in the end, um, we are almost at the end now, we can say that we can see really nice impact. It starts from that new departments have been actually created in the cities um, because they saw that there is a mandatory need for behavioral change, that this has to be assigned to someone, someone that is responsible, uh, quite a, a, something like a team that you know is there for for not just a, a particular time but rather as a permanent team and thus quite becoming part of the structure we also had a city that did a whole restructuring process coming from a silo organization meaning that the departments were quite yeah separate from each other to something like a project-based organizational structure quite a great shift um, that it could be more interdisciplinary, that it could be more interactive, that, that there were more knowledge exchange. We also had different formats that were introduced in the cities from stand-up meetings to creative sessions to move on with the question of how can we get um, the behavior change achieved, which was quite motivating for me to see and, very, and I was very pleased in the end. Let me just finish um, my, my words here with a lovely statement that we got from the deputy mayor in Calamares in Greece. He said actually that through the work, um, and I re will read it now, his statement, that through the work and the help of suits, um, Calamaria is now prepared, he said, to implement further KPIs to evidence their sustainable urban mobility planning and that they learned how important behavior changes to actually be able to really evidence what they do. That was quite quite motivating to get in the end. But now um, my side from the behavior side um, is over. I will turn um, now the or I will give now um, Anna the word and uh, love to hear from a totally different perspective how behavior change has to be achieved. 
Uh, thank you, Andrea. Uh, thank you for having me in this panel. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about what we, uh, through our research, learned about mobility behavior change uh, from the current situation with the COVID-19. So we all know that uh, reducing mobility uh, is one of the options on our menu when we are talking about reducing emissions from mobility. However, more often, um, measures uh, in sustainable mobility transitions have to do with switching to cleaner fuels, um, introducing more efficiency and so forth, and reducing mobility, moving less, is not a popular option at all politically. Uh, it has been even called a tab taboo. Um, however, as we all know, this year this taboo has been unexpectedly broken because, because of the COVID-19. And the societal debate opened about uh, maybe working from home, maybe moving less is a possibility. Um, and for us, uh, for the researchers, uh, this opened the possibility to study what a less mobile can look, less mobile life can look like. What is, um, uh, what is that people do not enjoy what is that people miss what are the disadvantages of the situations but also what is positive what people enjoy and what uh, we can learn uh, from the situation for mobility behavior change for uh, transitions to sustainable mobility so our idea behind the research was that now that the uh, commute is gone for many people, or um, it, it reduced dramatically the, the number of uh, uh, times people go to work around the world, and in Europe especially, um, it has decreased dramatically. We uh, People clearly see now what role commute played in their life, what, uh, um, why they are may have made particular choices about where they live and how they go to work, and maybe they begin to reconsider those choices. So this was our rationale, um, and uh, we asked, uh, we conducted two uh, research projects. One was a quantitative project a survey with uh, 1,000 people around the world, and another was a qualitative project, uh, 50 interviews, written interviews with people around the world, and we asked them we asked them to report on how they experience this change of, uh, when they do not commute at all or commute very little, what they like about it, what they dislike about it, what they think they are. Uh, would like to go back to or how their commute would ideally look like afterwards and so forth. So I will give you a few insights uh, from the results. Uh, what we found out is number one that uh, drivers miss their commutes the least and cyclists meet, miss their commute the most closely followed by people who walk to uh, work. Um, also longer commutes um, after 30 minutes are not are missed dramatically less. Um, so what we see is we see that a number of people actually uh, realize I, I'm much happier now than before, uh, especially drivers, especially people who have a long commute. But some people, especially people who cycle and walk, say, I love to do that. I actually even do fake commute, for example, by having a bike ride before and after my work anyway. I miss it. I need it. Um, which is encouraging news if you think about sustain, uh, transitions to sustainability. Um, we also see that mobility, uh, commute particular, in particular, has an intrinsic value. It's not about just the destination. We know about this from other research uh, previously. However, this is a very unique opportunity to really see that people are um, missing mobility for reasons that really have to do with the experience of mobility itself. For example, they like to be outdoors, they like to move, they like to see other people. They um, also experience this as their me time, time between private, uh, between home and between work, and they miss it, they need it, that transition time. Um, so uh, our results suggest that uh, the most socially desirable way of balancing the uh, competing desires, maybe to stay at home and save time on the commute, but also to be outside, to go somewhere, to have that experience, 
probably is a system that on the one hand enables more commuting by cycling and walking uh, in combination with public transportation where needed together with increased opportunities to work from home when it is desired when it is possible so a more balanced system uh, the fact that people really don't miss driving is an interesting finding that basically people uh, a lot of people ideally would have a system whereby they can use active modes combined possibly with opportunity to work from home um, although that the working from home is a completely different issue it's uh, for some groups for some people they really dislike it for some they enjoy it. it's they enjoy it it's a different subject uh, second uh, and uh, final finding is that we also see especially through qualitative research that people rediscover um, active modes um, a lot of people cycle, explore uh, active mode cycling and walking. They rediscover living more locally, uh, being more connected to local community. And importantly for us, for our session, is that this uh, localism actually is intertwined uh, with moving slowly, with walking and cycling. These are kind of part of the same uh, development. So uh, to conclude to short points, what it means for behavior change. Um, first, there may be a momentum for which policymakers can build on and help people to keep their new habits, to make, uh, make urban environment more conducive for walking and cycling. Um, we also see that it's very easy to return to business as usual so it is very important to harness this momentum and secondly uh, that policies for mobility behavior change need to recognize the intrinsic value of mobility and plan uh, not for more speed for more efficiency for cleaner fuels not just for that but for safe people-centered mobility, mobility that is enjoyable, mobility that people want to come back to and basically um, really focus around uh, uh, the needs that people have uh, in mobility and um, so that people would want to choose a particular mode above others. Thank you, I'm finished. Thank you, Anna. That was quite inspiring um, to see that actually all the climate neutral ways to move are uh, the ones that people miss. That's quite lovely to hear. But before we start the discussion, I would love first to hear the other panelists now. So Juan, maybe you can go ahead, please. Thanks, Mary. Uh, thanks, colleagues, uh, for sharing this moment together to discuss uh, behavioral change. Actually, as you said, uh, and Mary before, uh, when you introduced me, I'm working at EuroCities, more specifically at the mobility department uh, for five years now, but I'm not a mobility expert. I'm not an urban planner or my studies are not really mobility or, or related. I'm not a, a practitioner, if I can say, but I'm a communication expert. As you said, and Mary, uh, I'm a former journalist. And uh, since I started at EuroCities, have been taking care of the big European campaign promoting behavioral change, European Mobility Week. All the audience here today, the, the uh, almost 100 people connected today, uh, by the way, thanks for, for joining us. You already know European Mobility Week. I don't need to explain, so let's not waste our time in, in uh, presenting this. But let me tell you, or let me remind you that the uh, uh, European Mobility Week, the Europe-wide campaign on sustainable urban mobility has uh, two objectives. The final objective of European Mobility Week is to achieve the behavioral change, to achieve people's behavioral change. But first, before we achieve this uh, goal, this um, objective, we need to engage with cities, with town and cities. We need to engage with local authorities to make possible that this behavioral change is possible. And it seems that the campaign, European Mobility Week, is being quite successful in these terms, because uh, this year, and 2020 is a special year for everyone, we saw 2,941 towns and cities in more than 50 countries in Europe and beyond engaging in the campaign, promoting behavioral change, promoting sustainable urban mobility, during um, this week that was uh, two weeks ago, eh? very, very recent, you, you might know. So 
just uh, a quick reminder uh, for you, for the audience, for towns and cities, if you still need to update your registration or you want to add some last minute things, you can still do it until tomorrow. Tomorrow is the last day. We close the registration system tomorrow. That's an important announcement that I wanted to, uh, to make. So this uh, figure, um, almost 3,000 towns and cities promoting behavioral change, is actually more than the average of the last five years. So in that way, COVID-19 didn't really have a big impact. On the contrary, I mean, at the beginning, uh, in the European Secretariat, in the month of March, when we saw the lockdown measures in most of the European countries, we thought, OK, in September, no one is going to talk about sustainable urban mobility. No local authority will spend money or time or resources in promoting sustainable urban mobility. On the contrary, when we opened the registrations uh, before the summer, we saw a strong interest Local authorities, they are looking for examples, they are looking for uh, to exchange ideas on how to promote um, behavioral change and how to promote sustainable urban mobility. And um, if I can very quickly maybe answer one of the questions that you uh, launched at the beginning, uh, and Mary, without entering in the, in the discussion yet, uh, when you said, uh, are cities on the right track? Well, the figures says, yes, they are on the right track, right? More than 3, 000, almost 3,000 towns and cities. And since the year 2002, this campaign, uh, European Mobility Week, was born uh, in 2002 and almost 20 years after, the message is still relevant. And uh, this year is very special for us, I said, but we have learned many things. Many of the lessons that we have learned the local campaigners of European Mobility Week, the towns and cities organizing this campaign for many years, they already knew. They already knew the public space is, is precious, that any single square meter in our cities is, is gold. And we have to think about how to use it, right? But now this year, it has been made obvious for everyone, for our wider audience, if I can say. And this is also a key point uh, that facilitates our promotion, our um, a strategy for, for behavioral change, if I can say. But um, if I can finish by saying um, the keys of um, behavioral change, and this relates to urban mobility, but not only. Um, first of all, because I'm a, I'm a former journalist, but I'm also a, a former language teacher, uh, I would like to, to say that words matter. Words are very important. And here today we are saying, we want to change people's behavior, but actually we cannot change people's behavior. People change their behavior, but we don't change them. So that's the first thing that we have to be aware. Um, and uh, the, for me, the two keys uh, are um, the two keys for, for behavior, how people change their behavior. The drivers are, one is the, the imitation, right? We learn by imitating since we are a child. For example, when you go to a city that is much more um, cycling friendly than your own city, when you go as a tourist um, and you find yourself with a bike and you are in an intersection with more than 50 cyclists, it's like, okay, how should I react now? How should I interact with all the drivers? You just simply go with the flow. You just simply imitate what the others do, right? So this is a way of, uh, of changing behavior. But also the second driver for changing behavior for me is touching the feelings. Uh, only yesterday, last night, I was watching TV and I, I was watching one of the TV commercials from one uh, car. Most of the TV commercials is about car rides. And the, the, the message was, uh, it was a, 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 about an electric car, right? And the message was, now is the moment um, because now you can go faster and now you can be more free. And I thought, are you talking about a bicycle or no? They were talking about a car. And then I didn't understand, why should I feel more free? Or why should I go faster with the same car? I mean, it doesn't matter. The technology is going to spend the same time because the speed limits are the same and my city is the same, right? Uh, but what they are doing is touching your feelings. They are telling you, you are free. Even McDonald's, Coca-Cola and so on, the TV commercials today, uh, they are about what happened six months ago where we were all stuck at home. They are talking about video conferences with grandpa or now we can meet together, but um, only the two of us, finally, we, I can pay you this uh, uh, lunch that I, I owe you. They are not really related to the product they are selling, but they are talking about our feelings. So I think we can also do this. We have to enter a bit in the commercial world to, 
to speak the same language as people speak nowadays in social media with images, but also, as I said before, with words. And just to finish, the don't. I mean, this is what we should do, in my humble opinion. But what we shouldn't do is to criminalize. Um, and we can see this nowadays with COVID-19, especially in some, in some uh, countries, we can see a problem with young people because they don't really follow the rules. And then every day on the news, you can see images of people, young people making parties like, look at them, they are having fun, hold the whole day there. I mean, by pointing out, by criminalizing, and this is something that is proven in other campaigns, especially when it's about health, you don't achieve anything. It's, it's exactly the contrary. And we can also trans translate this into the urban mobility. If you criminalize car drivers, you are just giving them more reasons to drive their car. So maybe we have to think about it as well. This is more or less the points that I would like to put on the table for the discussion later. Thanks so much, Juan. That was quite interesting. I love this um, point that you made that it's not us that is actually changing people's behavior, but that is people that change their behavior and that we maybe have to think about how, who or what can we imitate because we love those kinds of role models. That's quite an interesting point that you raised. May I give the word now to Frank? Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, of course, Dresden uh, is also part of the European Mobility Week. We did it last week and we did a lot in the last years. And I totally agree with you that we not can criminalize anybody and we have to work continuously over a long, long time. So uh, Anne-Marie uh, introduces a bit that I showed the, the black side of uh, changing in mobility behavior. <laughs> Let's, I don't want to call it the, the black side, but it, it's kind of a realistic view what happens in the last years in, in cities. And Dresden is close to 600,000 inhabitants, so it's not a very large city, but it's, yeah, it's a real city with the real problems that cities usually have. Um, since the last 15 years, we could, see a change in mobility behavior. So from 11% cycling to 18% in, in 2018. And the car usage decreases from, I think, 44% to now 36%. So there is a change, but it's not a revolution. That's a kind of a continuous process that we have to manage and that we have to, to, to help to establish for for a long period. Uh, but I do not know many cities that have more than 65% of sustainable mode of transport. Yeah, this is the, the, the sum that we have at the moment. So pedestrian cycling and public transport is about 60, uh, let's see, 64, 65%. This is a relatively high number, but to increase this is quite difficult. I think we are in a kind of a, of a border because we have to see the framing, the background of taxes, of infrastructure. Yeah, sometimes, especially here, I don't know the tax regulation in other countries, you are nearly kind of stupid if you don't own a car. It, the, all those makes it very easy. And it's still the, the normal frame that you have one. And even in Dresden, the motorization is still growing, but what we see is the usage is decreasing. So many more people still buy cars, but they don't use it anymore. This is, this is a kind of a gap that's get bigger and bigger in the last years. We do not really understand this because there are alternatives. There's car sharing, bike sharing, public transport, but people still like their cars. That we have just, yeah, we have to realize that. And COVID-19, this was a nice point, Anna, was interesting here. We did a lot of analysis about this time. So public transportation got down to 30% to the normal usage. And this is, we st well, they could not still uh, come to 100% until today. So we have problems. And because of that, that many people own cars, but they, they usually do not use it. They did it in, in COVID-19 times. So, we have the problem to bring them back to public transport. Okay, uh, cycling was also uh, positively influenced by COVID-19. 
We have to keep this, but to bring people back to public transport. Yeah, and of course, you have other effects. A special digitization helps us to bring sharing opportunities in the in the mobility in the mobility field in the cities. Um, yeah, the, the the way electric mobility, that what what you mentioned, Juan, in in your commercial, that doesn't change anything. It's just a car. It's still a car, and all the problems with noise and and public space is still the same. It's just another kind of of powering the 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 engine. Yeah, but many problems that electric mobility does not serve. Um, another question for us is what are the pull factors? Yeah, if you don't want to educate someone, we need pull factors. And this, what, the main thing is to to try to to realize a deep integration of public transport with cycling, with sharing opportunities. So all those sustainable kinds or modes of transportation have to work together intensively. So with all those operators, this bike sharing, car sharing operators, to bring them together and to, to load it up with a kind of a local identity. Yeah, it's something good for you and for your city. So health and structural ideas and all those additional services that you have to bring together in public transportation have to be reliable, of course. I do not sell my car if I do not know whether the sharing service operates continuously, summer and winter, during night, like my own car does. It has to be that easy, like using your own car. And this is quite a challenge to, to bring that, uh, to make it as easy as private car using is. That needs consequent public relations, of course. But the most important thing is to have cooperative working structures within a, the city, the operators, the private, the public ones. This is challenging. And this is what we try to do. We do it since some years already, but it's still not so easy. And last point uh, for me, there are also some risks that we have to mention. The individualization of mobility. This is an effect that we seized in the last years. And the individualization can go to one direction or to another one, yeah? to more cycling, more walking, or more using individual cars. And also automatic driving was, was this such a main topic coming from up. You can see it in different ways to, 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 to bring automatic driving in a private car so that you never need transport, public transport anymore. The car brings you, picks you up, parks on, on its own, or to, to bring it in a sharing community. So say, okay, cars are automatic, but not private anymore and, and uh, are integrated in public transportation. And what I think at the last point, pull factors are limited. We are close to a point where we must say, okay, we do a lot. We have a lot of good services, but we're still at 65% and not 75, not 80. And sometimes the question of restrictions are on the table for us. But this is quite hard to, to implement. And we have, and we are proud of that, a democratic city. And it's not so common to, to rise the parking fees. And yeah, to, all enforcement is, is still a problem. But we need it, this is my thesis, to come up to more than 70, 75% in sustainable modes of transport. So. That's my point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. That was great to hear, I think, a realistic picture from the city. And there is maybe, I'm not agreeing with you that change must be a revolution. I think it's not a revolution. It's something like a very, very long lasting process. And I think we're on the right track, even if it's just 65%. But maybe just have to keep ourselves motivated to achieve the 100%. Maybe, but maybe you're right and we never achieve it. We will discuss this later on, of course. So last but not least, Juliana, would you like to give your statement as well to behavior change, please? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anne-Marie, for inviting me here today. Uh, the project I manage is a project uh, called EasMartech. 
I work for the Enterprise Division of Coventry University. Coventry University Enterprises is a fully owned subsidiary of Coventry University. We are, as an organisation, currently active in a number of projects that uh, uh, tend to benchmark and highlight best practice in innovation environments. Projects have taken place in sustainability, transport innovation, internationalization policies, big data, business models, and e commerce. Through this activity, Coventry University Enterprises provides input to strategic research and innovation agendas, not only in the UK, but also in the rest of Europe. Now, the project is Martech, is funded by the Interreg funding 2014-2020. And the project wants people to practically care about sustainable um, mobility. Its delivery relates to the adoption and development of a variety of marketing techniques aimed at promoting um, mobility. This project brings together nine partners from seven countries. And uh, um, our action plans, that, uh, the action plans that have been drafted will be based on uh, practically the most important appropriate uh, marketing techniques. The objective obviously is to shift users' willingness to travel by sustainable transport and also to encourage them to be an active part by participating in the mobility agenda setting itself. So we use marketing techniques to enhance citizens and stakeholders' engagement when sustainable um, mobility plans are developed. Um, so far, we have collected what we call good practices. We have collected a total of 76 good practices. And here, our regional focus in the West Midlands in the UK is actually um, about cycling. Locally, most importantly, in March, we have hosted an open street event just before the lockdown. Um, this open street event was with citizens at uh, um, a big green fair at Coventry University, which was part of practically what we call Green Week. On that occasion, we have distributed a questionnaire to people visiting our stand. And the aim of the questionnaire was practically to check if people cycle, how often cycle, on what occasion and which marketing techniques they would prefer in order to have a better take on cycling in our region. A total of 91 questionnaires were completed and uh, we are going practically uh, to be presenting the results of that to our exit panel, um, which is going to be happening in about a month's time. Looking at some of the results from the questionnaires and citizen engagement activities, we have discovered that in the West Midlands region, most of the people interviewed asked for more cycling routes and safer bike uh, parking spaces. Um, things like pricing and discount strategies are only relevant at a third place. Most importantly, around marketing techniques, um, our audience practically suggested that social media uh, were first with a staggering 44%. Uh, things like info points in the city centres and apps were a second or third place, but the gap was massive. So info points were like 18% and use of apps was 16%. So the fact that there was a, a massive sort of focus around social media gave us an important insight on what citizens would like in our area. So from a first analysis, the priorities in our uh, region, the West Midlands, are linked to de decarbonised road transport and investment uh, uh, in cycling seems crucial. Therefore, our action plan will probably help towards this direction. In November, we are planning to host an export, 
uh, expert panel, sorry, um, involving the city council and the local authorities um, for uh, transport. So here in the UK, is called uh, Transport for West Midlands. Um, during such expert uh, panel, uh, we will brainstorm ways to improve cycling in our region and thinking about possible actions that could be implemented uh, in supporting this. Now, all of this will be done, obviously, in the light of the latest COVID development in our region. Um, uh, although our focus around cycling uh, was decided um, probably about January time, so before uh, COVID and before lockdown situation, etc., since then, um, the focus not only of the local authority here, but of the regional authority and nationally as well has been uh, uh, to push, obviously, further cycling more than ever before. So new forms of funding and uh, uh, as well as new forms or and priorities have been set by the government at a national, regional and um, sort of a local uh, base. So, practically, the aim of uh, uh, the future discussions and brainstorming will be around um, what to do, how to spend the money that we have, and how to focus practically around what actually citizens would like to see. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Juliana. <laughs> it was great hearing what Coventry is doing, actually. Um, just of course. Maybe because I'm a commentator as well to see what's going on there. It's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's start with the discussion now. So I'm not sure whether the audience is there. I haven't seen anything so far. But if there are any questions in the audience, please use now the chat function to let us know uh, whether you like to ask particular questions to one of the panelists or maybe to the whole um, team. Um, I see already that there is a note in the chat. Um, <clears throat> perfect. I get the hint. There are already several questions in the chat, which is great. So. So we start maybe with the most recent one. Um, Personalized marketing, I'm just reading it now. Personalized marketing, awareness raising and education approaches to behavioral change all assume that the locus of change is inside an individual. Chills head or heart. We have know for long, however, that what people do is the result of a con compounding melange of factors that reside within and around a person. I have heard very little about letter, for example, tax incentives, infrastructure, social norms, product designs. So, look, this is um, a bit critical with the technique. Here we back. You name it. Could you please command on this? So the qu the question is: Is there anything in terms of the rather, let's say, hard facts like tax incentives, infrastructure, social norms, product designs, that you think should be named here, or would you say it's really in the heart of the people? So when we talk about behavioral change, who likes to start? I think that so personally, I've just got a sort of a, a, a personal opinion on it, and I really liked what uh, Juan said before, which is pretty much from a marketing perspective, it is all about playing around the feelings of the people and sort of shaking from within. So I would say it starts probably from a feeling perspective from the heart, and then it goes to the head. But it's a mix of both. Um, and um, I say that social circumstances and life circumstances like the lockdown have shifted have shift people's behavior in massive ways. But um, the, it started from a feeling perspective, I would say, uh, you know, what is happening? Uh, are we scared? Uh, do we wanna sort of um, 
jump on a bus um, or do we want to go on a bike uh, anywhere we want kind of thing. Yeah. So um, that is my personal opinion. Frank, please uh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a very important question, I think, because this is w what I call the frame of mobility. And of course, commuting. H how do I manage commuting? Who, who gets uh, yeah, tax revenue for commuting? Of course, this is important. And I think this is the main, one of the main factors that we still at 65, 70% and not not higher. Juan, Anna, if you like to say a word to this question as well. Yes, if I could add something actually um, to what uh, Juliana said as well, is uh, um, and myself, I, I also introduced earlier, <laughs> is that, um, well, apart from touching the feelings, uh, and especially, for example, we are talking about uh, uh, public transport, uh, right? How to promote public transport again. Um, we have to play with data. I mean, inform people, they can take their own decisions. I mean, we respect the freedom of everyone, right? To take uh, is the, in their decisions. But um, there are some limits. Uh, um, where the limits are, but basically the limits are where the moment that we are sharing a space, you are free to use your car, you are free to use, uh, to pick the, the mode of transport that you want. Um, to move freely, right? But we live together, you don't live on your own. And then here's where the city uh, has to set the framework that uh, Frank mentioned, right? Uh, so for me, the, the data and the education are very important. What Because here we are talking about concepts that um, during these months of lockdown, we talk very, um, without going into the detail the, of what is, for example, freedom. The other day I had a meeting with uh, young students in Austria, a virtual meeting, of course. And one of the questions was, you can discuss it with your professor of philosophy. Um, what is freedom? Is freedom the possibility of leave your apartment? Or is something much more, is a concept much more deeper uh, than we are talking about? Freedom starts with the way you think and not the, the way you can do things. The way you can do things relates to the norms that we need to respect to live together, to share the space. This space that I said before is very precious and the city is there to manage this space and, and to make sure that e-scooters, public transport, car drivers, cyclists and pedestrians can live together. And, and that's why data is so important. Uh, I said data is important because uh, we can tell people, okay, um, no need to go, uh, no need to go back to your car. Uh, mm -hmm. You can go back to your public to public transport because there are no data about reported cases of infection, for example, in public transport. So I, I wanted to introduce many ideas to to, to this uh, important question. But uh, sorry if I deviated a bit uh, the, the discussion, the debate. And Mary, I, I'll, I'll I'll go over to you so you can control <laughs> more more the discussion. Thank you, Juan. May I ask you another question, Anna? Because someone asked how to find a balance between what people want as collected with questionnaires or interviews, you talked about two studies here, and what actually have an impact on sustainable mobility? What comes first? Uh, was the question to me? So the question is, how we find a balance between what people really want. So you have these two lovely studies, you ask people there quantitative and qualitatively, and what actually have an impact on sustainable mobility? What comes maybe first in terms of, you know, what we want and what is there in reality? What is really having an impact? Uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a very big question and I'll just answer briefly and I'll open up and give it the floor to everyone because we have so many experts here. Um, I think uh, I just want to point out that what people want is um, a construction in a way. Uh, by that I mean, first of all, we um, often presume uh, what are the needs, but actually um, these are the, the needs that people express uh, are often uh, what they um, choose from the available from available options. Uh, for example, if you if people say I like to drive, uh, it's comfortable. Uh, this is most convenient. You cannot convince me that taking a tram or cycling or combining different options is better. It's not. 
but uh, you can say well that's what that person wants but that's also what uh, the uh, uh, what are their options in the current system uh, because their the train stop is uh, uh, half an hour uh, by bike, but then there is no bike path and so forth and so on. So we basically maybe lack like an infrastructure. Uh, we we also can talk about societal norms, uh, the way a car is equally comfortable in the Netherlands and in Germany, you know, uh, the same car would be equally comfortable, but the conditions uh, created by society uh legal infrastructural uh and also social norms are very different so the, what people want is something that can be shaped okay thank you anna maybe frank it would be great to hear something from i think a local authorities point um yeah uh, we make uh surveys since 1972 about the mobility behavior in Dresden. So we have a very long, yeah, yeah, long history about changing in, in mobility. And we know that there were very uh, intensive changes. And in 1972, we had about 38% public transportation. Cars were very expensive at this time and strongly limited. So there is something possible. Um, but of course, we have to respect the needs, and but but we also see that even in in Dresden, ninety two percent of all the inhabitants have easy access to public transport. Only eight percent not. But some of them do not use this because of personal feelings, safety, whatever. Corona is, is one effect, and we have to to go to the minds of the people as well. To, to convince them to, to try other means of transportation. But we also have to, to catch those, those moments where you move to another apartment or whatever, so, such breaking moments for this change effects. So at the moment, it's very interesting. And, and uh, th uh, three weeks ago, we started with our new bike sharing system and we just made one little thing. Now you can use your, your uh, public transportation passport and just lay it on the bike and it opens no app no nothing and that brings us more than twice the users that you had before the system still exists before but we we changed it so this is the the maximum ease of of using and it works so to to break down barriers but we also have to to realize that we won't get all all people convinced that there is still a part that we won't get. Can I sort of um, uh, or make an observation around that? So when we done our questionnaires, for example, we I think that there is a difference in kind of people that you're targeting. There are people, as Anna was saying before, there are people that are completely shut at the idea of going sustainable. Uh, there are people that they're pretty much like, no, this is how I've done. I like the car. I like driving the car. I don't want to do anything anymore, blah, blah, blah. But then there are people that they are convinced. There are people that they're super green and super sustainable, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are people in the middle. So I think that um, trying to um, influence people that they're on the verge, um, I would say um, uh, it, it goes also with the age. There are a lot of people that, younger people that tend to be on one side. There are people that they're in their 40s that they're in the middle. 30s and 40s are in the middle and then I mean it is a bit of a generalization but at least here locally it is like that. So when we done our interviews for example we targeted a target audience. We um, we wanted people that they were in that gap in the middle or people that they were already active in green. Uh, that there, there are four a thought about cycling already. They thought they actually um experimented cycling and they knew what would have worked on them in order to push them to do further. So it is also about your target audience, I think, and our opinion, we valued very much the opinion of the people that they filled our questionnaires because they were current cycle. Most of the people were cycling currently on different levels, but the age 
interested the age gap or say was anything between 18 and probably at a push towards the late 40s kind of thing Eliana, uh, later sorry. than that Eliana, i'm very sorry we have just 30 seconds left now and i know okay. that we will close oh, okay. so i'm sorry that yeah. i have to interrupt you now it was great to having all your opinions here i'm very very sorry that we have not been able to answer more questions there I can see plenty of questions in the chat, which have been, I think, absolutely worth, for, uh, worth uh, they have been worth to be discussed, but there wasn't any more time. So thanks to everybody. Thanks, first of all, to the panelists. Thanks to the audience. It was a lovely session, and I hope we will see each other soon. See you. Bye. Thank you, thank you everybody.